Well, last week, as Pastor Matt said, was a great, a great Sunday. You heard the testimony of what God did in Scott um, Price's life through the prayers that he and Anel and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people prayed for them. And then we saw... Uh, over 120 people come up in the services Sunday morning just to come up and, and gather here in front to cry out to God that God would do something great. There are big things in our lives. There are broken marriages. There are, uh, there are people battling addictions and, and temptations. There are um, fractured relationships. There's offenses and hurt. There's emotional um, issues that go back many, many years. There are things beyond what we can fix ourselves. And so people came forward last week, some in tears, just crying out, God, would you do something great for me? And we really believe God does want to do great things, but it won't happen if we just leave it to last Sunday. It's got to be something we continue to bring forward in prayer. In fact, there's a pastor that I admire a lot. Uh, uh, his name is Jim Simbola. And when he took over a church in New York called the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church, one of the things they decided was the health of their church was going to be determined by the prayer life of its congregation. It's not going to be reflected by the number of people that attend on a Sunday. It's going to be reflected by the number of people that are praying passionately for God to reveal himself. And I think they're so true that our spiritual health, corporately and individually, can be connected back to our personal prayer life. And God wants to do great things in response to believing prayer. It is the language of faith. Faith will speak to God. In fact, I don't think there's anything more evident of faith in our lives than the fact that we are calling upon God to do great and mighty things. Of all the spiritual disciplines, I think that is the, the most basic one. It just connects us to the heart of God. I've been in other cultures, and I confess I'm not good at learning languages. I just struggle to pick up languages. So I just get the basics down that, that I can, uh, mikasa, sukasa, uh, a jumbo, uh, mingalaba. You know, I can say a few words just to just to greet someone, but they start talking to me. I go, I don't know anything else. I can only greet you. And so, uh, all the languages though are beautiful, and God loves to hear languages because in the Book of Revelation it says, "In heaven will be people from every tribe and tongue." So they're all beautiful to God. But the most beautiful language, the sweetest language to God, is the language of faith, which is prayer. And he loves to hear prayers. Here's a passage from the book of Psalms, chapter 116. Um, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. What, this, what the psalmist is saying is, you know, I called on God and he answered. And because he answered, it makes me want to pray more. It makes me want to pray all the time. And I find that true in my own life. The greatest motivation for prayer is answered prayer. When my prayers are answered, it makes me feel like, God, I want to pray more. Now, I'm not saying all my prayers are answered. I'm just saying there's been enough answered prayers in my life that it makes me want to keep praying. And when I hear your prayers answered, that makes me want to pray even more. That's why you prayed last week. You heard Scott's answer to prayer. You said, I want some of that. I want to be in, in connection with that same God. And so we want to hear your stories of answered prayers and what God's doing in your life. And you can always email me at any time. My, uh, my email address is right on the back of your bulletin, uh, drondi at yestogod.org. Um, because it's not just for you. God didn't do whatever great thing he's doing just for you. He wants it to be a testimony. As Pastor Matt said, uh, we defeat what Satan's trying to do in our lives by remembering two things. One, what Jesus did on the cross, the blood of the lamb. And two, what he's done in my life and your life. And, I, and you can't shake that. You can't deny that. He's done something in my life. I, that can't be taken away. Satan can, can distort me and, and distract me and, and, and lie to me. But I know what Jesus has done and that can't be taken away. And so we want to continue to draw close to him in prayer, and, and I really want you individually to, to develop a deeper um, communication with God in prayer so that you know and have confidence that he's hearing your voice. And so Jesus tells a story to his disciples. It's called a parable. It's found in Luke chapter 18. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along there. If you have a phone with an app, pull it up there. You just read along on the screen. But Jesus begins with a preface or a purpose statement of what this parable is about. And here's how he begins. He says, and Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So if you're going to say, what's this parable going to be about? Well, here it is. You should always pray and not give up. This is about praying with frequency. First message is to pray with frequency. He says to always pray. To pray. That means to pray about everything. See, we pray about the big things, you know, the real big things. I'm looking for a new job, you know, uh, I'm dating this person, wondering if I should marry them. You know, the big things we, we pray about. Uh, but we don't pray about a lot of other things. 
And see, I'm not sure why we do that. Uh, Even our government is real good at saying, hey, we're going to keep prayer out of the public sector. Government should be not connected to religion, so we're not going to pray. But that, that if there's a national crisis, if there's a hurricane, if there's a bombing of a building, you will hear the president and many politicians say, we need to be praying for those families. So it's, it's, when something big comes across and we go, okay, that's, that's the hot button to God. Now we can pray. But God wants us to pray about everything, even the little things. And so when something happens in your life, here, here's where many people turn. Many turn inward. They turn inward and say, I, I can do this myself. I can handle it. I'll figure it out. Some people turn to substances. They turn out, outwardly to substances. You know, I can't handle it, so I'm going to take a few pills. I'm going to smoke a little weed, drink some alcohol, help me to cope with this, and then I can be able to handle it. Some of us just turn downward. We just drop our head and say, there's nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. And uh, we get depressed about it. And I have to confess, there are many things that you may pray about that will never change. But I'll promise you this. When that happens, what God wants to change is you. Because sometimes you can't change the circumstances, but God can change your perspective of the circumstances. And then, uh, so we can turn all these different directions where God wants us to turn us upward to Him. To, to take everything to Him in prayer. To ask God, God, I'm struggling with this test at school, help me, help me. Lord, I'm having trouble getting along with this other kid or this neighbor or this coworker. God, I really need help to do that. God, I have trouble overcoming something that happened to me in my past. I just can't shake it. God, I'm struggling with this temptation. Just every time it comes before me, I'm, I'm ready to fall and I can't deal with it by myself. And God, there's this physical issue that I'm struggling with and the doctors can't fix this and I don't know what I'm going to do. All these things, this is, this is what it means. Pray about everything. God wants to be involved in all parts of our life. And I know this because this was our message a few weeks ago in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every situation, not just the big ones, all every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I mean, what would happen if we would pray before we went shopping? Hmm... Pray before you go hunting, you know, pray. You know, would it change something about what we're going to do and what we're going to say and how we're going to spend our money if we would just start with prayer? God wants to be involved in everything. Pray about everything. But there's another aspect of of this praying always is that we should pray without ceasing. That means kind of like continuous prayer. In Psalm 55, verse 17, David said, Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Evening, morning, and noon. I, I looked at that and I said, that's odd because I would write morning, noon, and night. But he says evening, morning, and noon. That's interesting. Here's probably why that is. In the Jewish calendar, do you know when the day started? Sundown. Sabbath started, for example, Friday night at sundown. That, that's when Saturday began. So your day starts at sundown. So David's basically saying, I start my day with prayer in the evening. And I pray when I get up, and I pray through the day, meaning prayer permeates my day. That echoes what Paul said in the letter to the Thessalonian church, pray without ceasing. Prayer is a continuous conversation with God. You don't just pray during a slot. Say, God, you've got, you know, 6.30 to 6.45 in the morning. Here's my prayer. Hang up, and we go on with our day. Uh, prayer should be this thing where we, we never push stop. We, we never end it. We just continue the conversation. You say, how do you do that? How do you pray without ceasing? Well, don't confine prayer to a posture. You don't have to say, like, the only, when I pray, I get on my knees, or when I pray, I close my eyes. And, you know, what if you just said prayer has, has little to do with posture? Posture can enhance prayer, but it's not confined to posture. You can pray when you're showering. You can pray when you're walking down the road. You can pray when you're driving your car. Heavens forbid, do not close your eyes. <laughs> do not raise your hands, you know, Keep your eyes looking ahead. But you can pray. You can, you can pray right before you go into a meeting. You can pray before you respond to someone. You can pray when you're talking to someone on the phone and say, I'm going to get really mean right now. Lord, give me the right words to say. You know, you can. You really can. It's this continual conversation. Pray always. That's, that's part of what Jesus is saying here, to pray constantly. Pray frequently. Then he says, pray with fervency. Always pray and do not give up. That means I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go of my request until you answer. And either you're going to say yes, no, or you've got a better plan. But I need an answer from you, God, and I'm not going to stop praying until I hear from you. 
Uh, Jesus said once that prayer is like asking and seeking and knocking. It's a continuous process of, of pursuing something from the Lord. Um, God invites us to ask, but why in the world would he want us to ask repeatedly? Like, it almost feels like it's a lack of faith to pray and then keep asking, kind of like nagging, I'm nagging God. And so we come back to him and we ask, what did we ask for the day before and the day before? And we keep coming back and we, some people would say, well, that's a lack of faith. Just, just trust to the Lord, give it to him and then forget about it. And if God wants to do it, he'll do it. If not, he'll come up with a different answer. But I would agree with that, except that's not what Jesus is saying here. He says, don't give up. Don't let go of that thing. And I don't think it's because God is forgetful. I don't think God is saying, keep reminding me because I tend to forget. I think it's because God, God is wanting to know, do you really want this? And I'll give you an example. This just happened this month for me. Uh, Frontier Airlines constantly has these really great airfares. And so they had an airfare from Colorado Springs to Branson, Missouri for $37 each way. And I thought, oh my goodness. Usually you have to fly out of Denver, Denver to, to, to uh, Branson, and it's $300 or more per person. I said, we could go for like $150 for both of us. And there's a great Christian theater there called Sight and Sound Theater that's doing this um, incredible production of Samson. It's a musical. It's full drama. It's like a Hollywood production. It's powerful. And I said, how about for my birthday? We'll leave on Monday. We'll fly down there. We'll watch this. We'll come back, you know, Wednesday or Thursday, $150. And I got real excited. Say, oh, man, we got to do this. I called up another couple and said, would you guys like to go with us? This would be so much fun. And they hesitated. And uh, then, I, then I hesitated and says, you know, I'm just going to think about this through the day. And by the end of the day, I realized, you know what? By the time I add up rental car, hotel, food, everything, it's going to cost probably $600. And we're going somewhere next month in October, so why don't we just take that money and save it for that trip? And I didn't do it. I was so passionate about it in the morning. By the end of the day, I wasn't as passionate about it. I didn't want that thing. I'm glad I didn't make the phone call or, or, or make the reservation online. And I think sometimes our prayer requests are like that. God, in this moment, I really want this. And then it's gone. And if you haven't prayed all week long about the thing you prayed about when you came forward last week, I, from God's perspective, you must be asking, do you really want that? Because if you did, why did you give up asking? Why did you give up asking me for that thing? I've discovered in my own life, if I really want something in prayer, if I'm really like serious about it, like it's a big deal, I'll do two things. One is I'll tell other people, would you please, please pray with me? We need a miracle, and I need other people to join me. I can't do this. I don't have enough prayer power by myself. I want as many people as possible. It's kind of like Scott did last week. I'm going to let everybody I can know about this thing. You know, I would do that. Secondly, I would fast about it. There's something about fasting when I say to the Lord, God, this thing I'm hungering for from you I want even more than food. And that's a big issue. Because when you have, you know, I really want to see this uh, healing in my marriage. Oh, and those ribs really look good. I'm supposed to have ribs tonight for dinner. Okay, ribs win. And, and you know, you think, really? Food won over this thing you want? How bad did you want this thing? And I wonder sometimes, from God's point of view, because we're not going to die if we skip a meal. Or a day of meals. We're not going to die. You know, it's just, but it's hard. It's like what Matt said. Faith is hard sometimes. And sometimes I think you need to communicate to God. I'm really hungry for this. There's a lady in our church. She's on the mission field. And she was hungering for God to show her her future and even, even who she should marry and, and fasted for 40 days. And after that period of time, God, God answered that prayer and almost put right in front of her, her husband. And uh, they got engaged quickly, got married uh, this spring, and now they're going to have their first child here in a few months. And I wonder sometimes in our lives, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want that? Um, the problem isn't convincing God. I think God's, God's issue is convincing you and me because God wants to answer our prayers. Just He wants us to want what we're praying for. He wants us to pray with fervency, and that's how Jesus prayed. You know, in, in Jesus' life, the, the disciples saw him sneak away sometimes in the morning. He'd go off into the hills and pray and come back. And then they would see the, what he did in ministry, the effectiveness, the wisdom in which he served, the energy in which he served. And I believe that when they watched Jesus do the things he did, said, something is happening in his prayer life that we need to tap into. That's very different than our prayer life. So they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. 
They never asked him to teach them the study of the Bible. They never asked Jesus, teach us how to preach a sermon. Never asked Jesus, show us how you heal people, how to cast demons out. But they did ask this, would you teach us how to pray? Because they saw him sneak off, come back, do all these great things. Something's happening in your connection with your father. Now, this is Jesus, the son of God. He needed prayer. And how did he pray? Well, the disciples may not have heard the exact words he prayed when he went away, but I'll tell you this. I believe they heard him praying. Because somebody in the Bible wrote this in the book of Hebrews. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus was not a quiet prayer. I mean, I, I think I'd have goosebumps if I heard Jesus with fervent cries praying. You know, God, they're going to kill me, and I need you. I'm a human. I don't like pain. I don't want you to turn your back on me. He's crying out, tears flowing down his face. Jesus was intense, fervent. He wanted God to intervene in his life, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Do you ever raise your voice to God in prayer? I mean, I grew up in a culture where prayer was something you thought about. So I pray in my head, and I, my prayers are silent, and we offer good thoughts to God. We kind of send our vibes to God. You ever people say, send me vibes your way? You know, I'm sending this to God. But when I read the scriptures, I've come to learn almost every reference to prayer in the Bible is to audible prayer. Go back, the verses I just read. He heard my voice. I love the Lord. He heard my voice. I did. Nobody says, I love the Lord because he read my mind. Because he loves our voice. He, he wants us to lift up our voice to him. And so, fervent prayer and prayer that is frequent. That's the point of the story Jesus is going to tell. So, here's the story. It starts at verse 2. Jesus said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. <sighs> Get her off my back. Give her what she wants. That's his attitude. And then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So one thing you need to learn about a parable is Jesus already told you what it's about. Always pray, not give up. That's what this parable is about. And if you're not careful, you could, you could do the typical thing of interpret this parable by comparison. This, this is the situation, and it's like this. So many of Jesus' parables were like, uh, man went out and sowed seed, and the seed is like the Word of God. And the birds that come down and eat the seed, that's like the devil that comes and snatches the Word away. And the weeds that grow up and choke the growth out of the, the seed's life, are like the temptations and cares of life that choke our spiritual growth. It, one thing is like another, but in this parable, it's, it's not comparison, it's contrast. This is the situation, and, and in this situation, a woman got results. But I'm telling you that your situation's even better than that. And it's contrasting that if this would happen in this situation, then it really is going to happen in this situation. Get my point? This is so much better what I'm going to tell you. And he says there's these two characters. There's a, a widow who's very destitute, and there's a judge who's very ungodly. And her request was heard in that situation. And there's two messages that just kind of flow out of here that, that give us the motivation to pray always and not give up. And the first is this. Unlike the widow in the story and her relationship with the judge, we have a relationship to the person we're praying to. We have a relationship with God. We don't come as strangers into a courtroom, we come as children in the presence of our Father. And there's grace. See, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, in the fourth chapter, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. We get brought into his presence because we are children of God. And every person who trusts in Jesus becomes born again. You become a member of God's family. God is now your heavenly Father, Abba, Daddy, Father. We can talk to him. 
as a father. And because of this relationship, we have access that others don't. I knew a pastor years ago who, uh, before cell phones, had a phone line in his office. This was a big church. They could afford to do it. One hotline into his office. And when that phone rang, he knew it was one of three people, one of my elders, my wife, or my kids. If that phone rings, no matter what I'm doing, I'm answering that phone. Because children have access. Do you know, think about this in your, in your home. If you get a phone call at 9 o'clock at night and someone says, hey, we're doing a survey about political candidates, what's your view on this? And you go, sorry, I'm just not interested right now. Oh, well, just let, let me just ask you a couple questions. Sorry, I'm not interested right now. Goodbye. We hang up, right? I have, I have no relationship with this person. I'm not interested in what they're talking about. Uh, we're done. But I'll tell you this. If I get a phone call at 2 in the morning and it's my daughter and she says, Daddy, I'm sitting right up in bed and I'm talking to her. I'm fully attentive to her. What's the difference in these two calls? One is a stranger. One's my child. Think about that. When you come to God as his child, what do you think God's doing? And let me tell you this, because some of you come from different backgrounds, grow up, maybe just different mindset of yourself. You think there are levels of Christian, you know, there's, the, there's me, and then there's the, the you know, the, the good Christian people, and then there's the pastors and missionaries are way up here. But I want to tell you, every child of God has the same access. You don't have to go through a pastor. You don't have to have me pray for your needs. I will, but you don't have to have me. You don't have to go through a priest and have them pray for you. You have direct access to God. Why? Because you're his child. And sometimes I wonder if even the littlest kids have the most access because, what I mean by the, the, the newest believer, because in our, our family, it's the little kids who get mom and dad's attention the most. You know, when the little three-year-old cries out, Mommy, you know, we come running. It's when the teenager just says, Hey, Mom, Dad. You go, Be quiet. I'm watching the ball game. You know, <laughs> we, we might say that to our kids. You know, we should be better, but we don't do that to our three-year-old. You know, we, we write. Why? Because they're helpless. They need us. Well, when you come before God and say, I need you, God doesn't say, Grow up. Suck it up. You know, tough. Take care of it yourself. He says, Come to Daddy. Come to Daddy. We have a relationship with him. It's a beautiful thing to know that we can come into his presence. I, I think one of the most important disciplines to teach any person, a new believer, and teach our children is how to talk to God. You know, before they're old enough to read, before they're old enough to, you know, give money in an offering, before they're old enough really to serve in the church, uh, as soon as our kids, grandkids, start to talk, even before they can talk well, say, we're going we're gonna to pray. And we want you to pray to God, to thank God. And, you know, I love when my grandson prays. And sometimes he doesn't feel eager, but we convince him. It says, just give God thanks for something he did for you today. Or pray for someone who has a need. And then he'll go, okay. And dear Jesus, you know, it just melts my heart because I want my kids and grandkids to know God is approachable. And he loves to hear your voice. He really does. So, God loves us when we're his children, and we have privileged status that the widow in this story didn't have. That's why we can have even more confidence. We're not, we're not trying to get God's attention. We have his attention. And secondly, not only do we have a relationship, but, but it's about God's responsiveness to us, his fatherly responsiveness, that he, he wants to do something for us. He wants to bless us. Sometimes we feel like God's annoyed at my constant asking. And, and you can be selfish in, uh, in your asking. And I'm not talking about looking at God as a, as a genie in a bottle. You know, I need something from you, God. Please do it. But I'm talking about really of fatherly. Like, God, I want to do good things for you. I want to live for you. And I need, I need this in order to do that for you. And so we call out to him. God wants us to lean into him. And I really believe that God wants more for you than you even want for yourself. Because when I look through the panorama of Scripture, I just find this God who's so generous. He puts Adam and Eve in this garden that's filled with beauty. All kinds of stuff that's, that's like, here's your paradise. This is for you. Now, they appreciate it, but then they turn their backs on God and listen to the serpent and go another way. And so God then later says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to start things over with you. Raise up a race of people, and you will be a father of many nations. And I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. So here again, God's wanting to bless. And then 
And then as people rebel again, they end up in Egypt. They, they serve as slaves for a number of years, and God rescues them. He takes them um, out of Egypt and leads them to a place called the Promised Land, Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, the image of that is kind of gross, like really sticky stuff all over, you know, milk on my feet and honey. Uh, but what is a picture there of is prosperity. This is a place that's very fertile. The cows are very happy. They produce a lot of milk. The, um, the plants are producing very well. That's why there's so many bees around. The bees are making honey. It's a, it's a healthy, abundant place. And so, you know, they struggled again, just accepting all God's good gifts to them. So God says, you know what? I'm going to have to um, bring a, a new era called the new covenant. In that new covenant, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you. I'm going to bless you in this new covenant. You'll have things you never had before. And so then Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly abundantly. And then Paul says, we go to a God in prayer who's able to do immeasurably beyond all we ask or imagine. He's not a stringent, stringent God. He's not a tight one. He wants to do abundantly beyond. And then John in Revelation says, boy, when you get to heaven, there's going to be things that you've never seen before, such beauty and glory and health in heaven. No more sickness, no more death. You think God is stingy? He's not. He's generous. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And as children, we have, get this, this was in that verse from Galatians, an inheritance. We are heirs. Now, I've never received an inheritance, but sometime this fall I will because my mother passed away in December. We closed her estate in the summer, and they're tying up all the loose ends, and all the kids will get a small check this fall sometime. It's not going to be a whole lot, but you know, when I get that check, I'm gonna, I've already told Julie, says, I'd like to do something that would honor mom. I want to do something that mom would say, I'm glad you did that. And you know, it's a gift. An inheritance is a gift. It's, it's an asset someone else has who then gives it freely to you. Now, I know families fight over inheritances, and that shouldn't be because it's a gift. It's not, nobody owes you an inheritance. It's a gift. And God says to us as believers, I have an inheritance for you. Now, a lot of it is in future. We'll get it in heaven, but some of it is something we can access right now. And the main way we access it is through prayer, through God's great and precious promises that he makes to us while we're living here on earth. And I think sometimes God says, why aren't you cashing in? I, I have all this, all this good stuff available for you. I mean, Jesus was teaching his disciples another lesson on prayer and said, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Another contrast. He says, you guys, you men, I know what you guys are like. A lot of you men are, can be real pigs at times. I know some of you men have real bad temper. Some of you, some of you men have really uh, impure thoughts. Some of you men can be very selfish. But, but even so, when it comes to your kids, you know how to be good to them. When your little boy comes up and sits on your lap and says, Daddy, can I have a bite of your ice cream? You give it to him. He says, if you, though you are a sinful person, know how to be good to your kids, how much more will your heavenly Father be good to his kids when they come to him. How much more? See, God is a generous God. He wants to give good things to us. And so he, he's asking us to open our hearts and come to him in prayer. And, and God's not offended by asking when we ask so that he could be glorified in our lives, that people would see the amazing things that God does. God's not, God doesn't cater to our selfishness, but God wants to do things through us to show to the world what kind of God he is. And so when Jesus gets to the end of this parable, he just makes this closing comment, this, this statement that summarizes the whole thing. And when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, if Jesus were to show up right now, would he find us praying? Because this parable, though it is all about Prayer is how faith is evidenced. He says, will he find faith? Will he find his people in believing prayer when he comes back? And so this week, I'd like to, to do a couple things. I'd like you to carve out some time in your schedule. Carve out some time where you would say five or ten minutes a day to go off in a quiet place and that you would just find the secluded place for, for you to pray. And then do two things in your prayer. Some of you have a bigger prayer life, but some of you are just kind of getting started. So do two things in prayer. Number one, acknowledge who God is. 
Just acknowledge who he is. God, you are my father. I come before you. Thank you for accepting me. Or God, you are my rock. God, you are my savior. God, you are my Lord. You are my king. Whatever it is, acknowledge who God is to you. And then second, ask. Ask a bold request. God, that thing I prayed for last week, I want to come back and bring it again. I'm not going to give up on that thing. I really need to see you work in my life in this area. And so I'm praying for you to to do that. And do that Monday and do it Tuesday. Do it Wednesday. Do it Thursday. Do that Friday. And see what God does. Now, I'm not saying God will answer you in the, a day two or day three. One of my favorite authors is a man named Mark Batterson. And Mark, he just wrote this beautiful book on prayer called Circle Maker. Um, love this book. This is the book that actually inspired me to start having Thursday morning prayer at 6 o'clock at the church. And we would start with, in our own prayer circle, praying for God to start revival with that person inside the circle. And in this book, he makes this statement uh, on page 87. He said, I recently realized I'd stopped circling one of the seven miracles I had written on my prayer stone several years ago. I once believed that God would heal my asthma, but I got tired of asking. See, when he was 14 years old, a pastor and some church leaders came to his house to pray that God would take away his asthma. Really, it was a, it was a debilitating illness that he had. And so they prayed over him. And the next morning, he awoke and a miracle had taken place. All the warts on his feet were gone but he still had asthma. <laughs> he said, God, how did that happen? How, all the warts that I had, we didn't even pray for the warts, but they're gone. But I still have the asthma. So he kept praying for the asthma. Now, this is when he was 14. Prayed, prayed, prayed many years. Then he stopped praying. In, in 2011, when this book was published, he says, I started praying for that again. And then he says, is there some dream that God wants to resurrect? Is there some promise you need to reclaim? Is there some miracle you need to start believing for again? The reason many of us give up too soon is that we feel like we have failed if God doesn't answer our prayer. But that isn't failure. The only way you can fail is if you stop praying. 2016, he was healed of asthma. 2016. Why did God wait all these years? I have no clue. I have no clue. But he knows this, God has healed his asthma and God has answered his prayer. Jesus says, always pray and don't give up. And so we're actually going to start that today. Go ahead and stand. We're going to pray right here in this place. Now, I know we can't go and find a quiet place to get by ourselves, but I'm going to ask you to do this. In just a few moments, band's going to play. We're just going to create an atmosphere here where you can pray. And please don't leave during this time. This is very important. I want you to to pray for those two things. Acknowledge who God is to you and ask him for that great and mighty thing you need him to do, okay? And I'll ask you to do this if you would. Would you do it out loud? You You don't have to shout it. You don't have to shout it. But would you pray out loud? Why do I say it? Because God loves to hear your voice. It may be a low voice, Some of you may need to raise your voice up. Some of you may have tears as you cry out to God. Let him hear your voice. Don't worry about the person next to you. They're praying too. Don't listen to them. You focus on your God. And let's see what God does as we lift up our voices. Because if you can learn to do that in the safety of this environment, my hope is that you'll leave this tomorrow. You're going to do it. And next day you'll do it. And you'll create a lifetime pattern of coming before God because God is good and wants good for you. Do you want that same good for you? So let's take a few moments. I'm going to turn my mic off and begin praying. I'd like you to wear right where you are if you need to move around. If you want to kneel or raise your hands or close your eyes, however posture, whatever posture you want, that's up to you. But for the next few minutes, let's just pray, okay? Let's lift up our voices.